Hi, I'm Kelly Chase and this is History Detective and today I want to talk about that time that the bubonic plague came to Australian shores in the early 1900s. The Black Plague travelled to Australia by boat. In 1895, a Tasmanian newspaper published one line under the heading Plague. The bubonic plague is raging at Hong Kong and the mortality is very large. I guess this tells us they're aware of the disease, but clearly it was not enough of a threat to report on in any depth. By the 1st of January 1900, the news reports were becoming a little more specific and the fear of the pandemic arriving on Australian shores was becoming more intense. The Board of Health have accepted the press telegrams as to the presence of the plague at Hawaii as being correct and their executive officers have been instructed to be on the alert in regard to vessels which may have touched any port in the Hawaiian group so that they may be promptly quarantined on arrival here. The newspapers on New Year's Day of 1900 were full of reports of cases in the Pacific Islands including Numea, Hawaii and Polynesia which is a group of about 1,000 islands and there were urgent calls for an anti-plague vaccine. In an article headlined Sydney Passengers Still at Large, a journalist reports no further information has been received with reference to the whereabouts of the 11 passengers from New Caledonia who landed in Sydney from the steamers Pacifique and Maroc. Just to compare, this was a byline from a March 2020 news article. At least 440 passengers from the liner have fallen ill since being allowed to disembark without checks in Sydney. Oh, history. Shirley Bassey was right. You do have a habit of repeating yourself. A Sydney newspaper article gives us an insight into the conditions, race and class distinctions that existed in Sydney in the 1900s. This was just one year before Australia became federated and introduced the Immigration Restriction Act, which limited non-white immigrants to Australia and remained in place for 70 years. The article says, If the plague comes to Sydney, it will invariably visit the tenements of the slovenly, dirty and poor. The reason is that it is propagated by uncleanliness. It has been aptly called the poor man's plague. The journalist then goes on to visit the Chinese quarters of Sydney and states, All of the Chinese whose establishments face George Street are dirty in habits and environment. So although in this case the Chinese were not being blamed for starting the outbreak, this journalist seemed to be ready to throw them under the bus in case of an impending outbreak. By April 1900, private schools were being hit hard by the plague panic because parents were pulling their children out of schools so that they could be homeschooled from their country estates. So far, we have seen evidence of apathy towards the plague, denial that it existed, ships bringing it to Australian shores, class and race blame for the spread, schooling from home, a race for a vaccine, economic ramifications, quarantines and overloaded hospitals. I could easily be talking about 2020, but no, it was 123 years ago. The symptoms of the plague were listed in an article by W.J. Simpson, M.D. The general symptoms of a typical case are shivering, high fever, nausea, vomiting, intense general or frontal headache, painful and tender bubo, staggering gait, congested eyes, anxious expression, coated tongue, except on the tip and edges, and restlessness with uncontrollable desire to wander aimless to some distant locality. That is the first time I've ever heard of wanderlust being a symptom of the plague. The government of the time created a plague department and their job was to clean and disinfect premises and drains and destroy any articles that may be infected. By April of 1900, they had visited more than 11,000 properties and handed out 1,500 notices in Sydney. Cases of imported fruit, over 1,000 rabbits, 1,400 barrels of fish, quarters of beef, and sides of bacon were all destroyed in the cleansing. People were also ordered to remove rubbish, filth and manure and replace defective toilets. But it wouldn't be the bubonic plague without a few rat stories. In Bendigo, the council was offering a measly three pence per dead rat. A Brisbane newspaper printed a recipe for killing rats and the journalist bragged that his recipe killed 600 rats in three nights. If you can kill 600 rats in three nights, they must have been absolutely everywhere.
There are quite a few stories of local rat catchers who contracted the plague and obituaries of those who had died from the plague. It was not only a poorly paid job, there was the very real danger of ending up infected. Looking at some of the historic photos of rat catchers, it seems a prerequisite was to have a dashing moustache and a jaunty hat, and an added bonus was a Jack Russell Terrier, who were apparently excellent at catching rats. Another similarity between the past and present, which can be seen in some of the historic photos, is the PPE of the medical staff. In this photo, you can see some of the doctors and nurses from Maryborough wearing their specifically designed overalls with a hood and a respirator. These two nurses were delivering meals to some patients in isolation. Notice the massive bolts on the outside, a barred window above the door and a slot for delivering food. Maryborough also houses a memorial fountain that is dedicated to two nurses who died after volunteering to care for some children who had contracted the pneumonic plague. Don't forget to hit subscribe and if you would like to hear an original song on this topic, there is a link to Roses Are Black up there. And in the description below, you'll find a link to my website where you'll find a list of references and links to teaching resources. This is Kelly Chase on The Case. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this video is being recorded today. I pay my respects to the elders and knowledge holders past, present and emerging.